Yeah, hi everyone. Thanks for coming today. A um, little bit of a mix up between the times, but it's great to see everyone here. A um, little bit of an introduction about me. I'm Beck. I'm an electronic music producer, and I say that and not just techno, because I do do other music at the moment, and I'll go into that a bit later. Um, I'm from the south coast of England, but I moved to Berlin seven years ago to really follow my passion of music and uh, really get more into being a producer. Because life in London was, you know, expensive and all the rest of it doesn't allow much time for music. And I definitely made the right move because I'm very happy with my career um, today. And I think that I'm on the right track for sure. So. Yeah, now I'm also um, signed to Buddha Music Publishing, so I now um, I write, write for other, well, with other artists and also singers, producing um, tracks um, for them, which I really enjoy. And yeah, I firstly started my musical journey at SAE in London. I was really just DJing before that and realized that if I wanted to get anywhere and play any of the big shows, I really needed to learn how to make music. So I just threw myself in head first. Um, that was seven years ago now. So yeah, now I'm here and uh, I'm, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty happy with where I am. I would say I'm a much more creative producer. I don't really go into as many of the technical details until afterwards. So I really separate those two parts of my production. But I'm going to, yeah, start from how I stay creative and how I am in the studio. And then the last part of the, the, the masterclass is going to be showing you like what I've been up to um, in Ableton and actually just starting a track together now as well and showing you how I do that. So yeah, the first part, staying creative, how to start and finish ideas, because finishing is also, as we all know, quite tough. Um, and how to work through creative blocks, because essentially I think that's what stops most of us from finishing really good music. So a little bit of like a fact here, 68% of creatives have suffered mood problems such as anxiety and depression due to their work, because a lot of people don't realize that, you know, we're either at home producing on our own or in the studio and it's just, you know, us and those four walls and the, the door, whatever you're using, I use Ableton. Um, and I feel that this can become really overwhelming sometimes. So, you know, there's a lot of pressure we put on ourselves to write great music. And if it's not flowing, it's sometimes there's nothing more frustrating. Um, I find personally myself anyway that I really beat myself up if I get to a certain point in a track and it just can't go, it, it's, it's not going further at that moment. I'm, oh, why am I not good enough? Like, you know, this idea sounded good in the beginning, but now actually I think it sounds like bad. Um, so I feel that, yeah, there's a lot of these kind of negative self-talk that starts to go on. Um, and I'm gonna talk about how I, how I deal with that as well in a bit, because essentially I think this is one of the most key parts to being a successful music producer. And that's why I'm, I'm starting with it now, because you can learn all the technicalities um, and get better at those with time. But I do feel that as an artist, and especially in the music industry, your mindset is, is actually everything as well. Um, and one massive subject to do with that is comparing ourselves to others, um, especially, you know, there are so many DJs out there. And um, also some of our friends might be doing slightly better, but it's not better. They're just, you know, everyone's on their own journey and their own vibe. And it's about just staying true to yours and focusing on yours um, so that you can do really great work in the studio. And I think there's lots of ways that we can maximize that, which I'm also gonna talk about as well. So yeah, we, we sometimes apply pressure to ourselves and we feel, or I've definitely felt in the past, extreme highs and lows, like, oh wow, I just finished this track, it's incredible. Um, I'm the best producer ever, I've got amazing skills. 
And then one week later or a few weeks later, I haven't finished anything in a while. You know, damn, actually that track was a fluke. It was a one off. And um, I think <laughs> I don't know any other profession that is like this um, in terms of people feeling, you know, really high one day, really low the next. And that is a bit how it's like in like the music career as well because you'll have like waves that are really good and some waves are like a bit like tougher you know get really like busy periods and then at least unless you're like really at the naught point one percent of top top names you also get the quieter periods the ones that are more difficult and though those are the ones where you have more time to go to the studio so it's usually, you know, when we get some downtime off touring, going to the studio, but then how do we remain in the headspace to still make great music? Um, so, yeah. So, yeah, I know what it's like to be blocked and um, music making is so subjective. So, firstly, I also want to talk about people's opinions. There can be... You know, I used to ask all of my mates, you know, bounce like a small loop and be like, do you think this is worth finishing back in the early days? Send it to five people and get so many mixed responses. So it's really about tuning into to ourselves a bit more. Um, and there's so many options, especially with software and VSTs. It's just absolutely endless. So you could sit there and tinker with one idea for a day. Um, so it's like, how do you actually really make those decisions? Okay, okay, this drum pattern is done now, and I'm going to move on to the next part of the track. Or, yeah, this synth pattern sounds good like that. And then I find if I start to change notes, once I've got like a, a loop done, if I start to kind of fiddle around with it, then, then I can get lost in that trap of... Okay, it sounded good before. Now I've lost that those notes, and now like, where am I? Like, I don't think it's as good as it was before. And then sometimes I realize I've been trying to get better like sequence for one hour, and um, I really try to avoid that these days. If something sounds good, then bam, it's that's that's the track. I don't. I really try not to waste time or get stuck because the second I start to play around, the second, like, my whole momentum is, like, finished, basically. And my, my whole, like, mental attitude with that is, okay, great, this idea can be one track. If there is another idea coming out of that track, I'll make two. So I'll just, like, you know, get the first one done, and then I'll come back to what I also thought sounded good, because the worst thing, I think, is having too many ideas in one track. Um, simplicity really is the key and it's so difficult to get there um, and to actually, yeah, make those decisions basically. Because I, I think like linking back to the previous slide, it's like decision anxiety. You know, how do I decide that that's what I should go with? Um, and I would actually give the advice not to share it with others, you know, until it's really finished and you're happy with it. Just focus on it yourself and start to learn how to close those decisions off and, um, yeah, and create the key elements of each track. Um, I will link this back to the mindfulness aspect. Um, I think it's definitely linked to confidence and how we're feeling that day, if we're, you know, wait, woken up on the wrong side of the bed, we don't know what to do tonight, like, we're a bit, like, indecisive, then if we get in the studio or get in front of the, the door and we're in that mood, then, yeah, all your decisions, because it's, it's essentially about lots of small decisions and um, they're going to all be a bit hindered. So it's also about noticing when you're in that mindset and trying to you know, fix how you're feeling or try and kind of get out of that, that mode. So yeah, I've put this now because um, I'm really passionate about all of this mindfulness stuff, as you can see. Um, but it's basically like, who is the judge of how good or bad what you're doing is anyway? You know, you are the judge of it. So um, it's about like, maintaining that feeling and that power like within yourself 
Um, is this idea aligned with you? Uh, because something I've definitely done as a producer, and I think a lot of other people have as well, is basically looking at other tracks and being like, oh, I would actually like to create something like this. And then sometimes even getting a reference and putting it in my, my door. But then, you know, halfway through me making the track, I realize like something's not sitting right. It's not really feeling like me or, you know, taking too much inspiration and then being left with something very confusing at the end. Um, and after quite a few years of, I mean, in the beginning, I do want to dig into that a bit more. In the beginning, I, I did that a lot. It's actually how I learned as well. It's just, oh, I love that kick and bass, right? I'm going to put that in my project just as a MP3, whatever. And then I'm just going to try and recreate that. Um, watch a ton of YouTube videos, absolutely everything to try and see, or even like, you know, a snare or a like synth pattern. And I think that's good when you're learning and to kind of develop your skills. But once you've kind of learned enough to create those elements completely by yourself, which I'm sure a lot of you here are already way past that stage, um, I feel that any time we take too much inspiration from other tracks, it's, it's actually like not really good for us. Um, and it's nice to like listen to other music, of course, that's essential. But actually like trying to like copy or trying to be very influenced actually when you're making the music is probably something that I learned um, never comes out well. It never really sounds like a great track at the end of the day for me anyway. So, yeah, that's something that I've tried to, to stop, although I was used to doing that from the beginning when I was just trying to learn. Um, so that's a bit on that. Um, but yeah, when I'm writing ideas now, I'm really, I'm more kind of just feeling how it feels. Like I'm writing the kick and the bass to start with for sure. And I'm just feeling, you know, the rumble of the, the lower vibrations. And i am um, always got it up pretty loud, which is why I actually had to get a studio out of my home. <laughs> I don't know if anyone else has had that problem. Um, but yeah, so it's more about just being aligned to yourself. Um, taking, taking inspiration when you're out clubbing on the dance floor, listening to music in the day. But when you get in front of Ableton or whatever you're using or hardware, it's more about just playing around until you find something you feel good with, I think is the best um, approach. Um, and yeah, just something else on the opinions, because this says bad, like opinions create identity and identity creates opinions. So it's basically saying that opinions, especially in the music industry, I feel that they they have negative impact on us as music producers sometimes. Um, because I also know from my past that I, I ask so many different people and I get all these mixed responses and it just makes me feel a bit overwhelmed and, you know, like question everything again and maybe never even send that track out in the end. Um, so yeah, I also said here, when have you uh, tried something for the first time? So with music making, as we know, there's like endless possibilities and we just usually get so in the flow of doing things our way that we don't realize that, okay, if we are a bit blocked, maybe we can just get on YouTube or watch a tutorial or try and learn something that we've never learned before. That's something that I definitely try and do. Um, and yeah, I think that's all I wanted to say for this part. Um, so there's, <laughs> I'm gonna just go through some ways that I've, I, keep, I stay creative and this one's a bit fun. Um, so basically I would either like do something to make me feel good. So get outside, go to the nearest park, um, just try and get yourself out of that headspace of like, this track's not going well, or like, I'm not in the mood to make music today. Um, phone a childhood friend, you know, connect to your friends, 
get yourself just off the subject for like 20 minutes. Um, recall if you've been on holiday before um, and like where that was and try and get back to these old feelings of like, you know, sitting on a beach and having a good time. Another thing I do is go through and delete old work or like tidy up files. I know it sounds very like monotonous, but actually like the feeling of after doing that, feeling organized, feeling structured, that can also allow space in our mind for like new ideas and pushing through feeling blocked. Um, so yeah, take an extended break. It doesn't matter if that's like five minutes, one hour, the whole day, or even the whole week. Um, we need that sometimes because I would compare my creativity to like a battery and I'm sure a lot of you as well. So the battery is full, I'm super creative, but the more I used it, the more it gets drained. And then um, when the battery is empty, it needs to recharge. So I really like take my music making in the same approach. If I have made three tracks in the week, I know there's probably not much point going to the studio for the next few days because I've already been so productive. And I know that if I go back, I just know myself so well now with this that like it's probably not going to be yeah, as good as the last few days. And if some people's batteries are like huge and they can do weeks and weeks of great tracks, then amazing. But I know I can't, um, or well, that's not my pattern or flow. So what else do I do when I blog? So I create samples, recordings, and organize them for future projects. So if I still want to be in the studio or, you know, I've dedicated that day to music making, but I'm not creating a track, then yeah. I can just even, you don't have to have hardware, I'm not sure. Hands up if you use hardware here. Yeah, okay, so a few of you. Um, but I think that's becoming less and less now because software is just, let's admit it, it's, it's a much easier process to just record straight in. Um, so yeah, I would create samples and recordings that can be from VSTs as well, right? So it's more fun to do with hardware sometimes, but you can just open your favorite synth and just like record a load of pads as audio and then save them in a folder, like create your own samples. So, you know, I do use Splice. I'm sure a lot of you have Splice as well, but obviously if you have your own samples, no one else is gonna have them. And what I think is quite important is building up your sound. So if you have a similar pad that you always use in your tracks, this is really good to kind of get your kind of familiar sound. Um, for example, I'm always using the Jupiter for my pads. Um, and I had a preset which I create, which I liked, so I just fiddled around with it and just then saved it again. Um, and yeah, so I think just in, like improve your bank of samples and also I Ableton templates. You can also do MIDI patterns. Um, for example, I have like a whole drum rack, um, which I'm just pulling in from my MIDI sometimes. And um, it's already got like the patterns as well. So that's a really good way to thing to work on when you're not feeling so creative. Um, yeah, I also improve my default sessions. So like my BPM is usually changing quite often, but actually lately it's gone faster and faster. I guess like a, a lot of people have, um, but I just also felt that I always wanted to be a bit faster. So I will actually just change my default session so that I don't even have to think about it when I open Ableton. Um, so yeah, researching new VSTs or instruments you'd like. I think that one is good to speak to people, other friends who are producers, you know, ask, have you found anything lately that you like? Um, yeah, any new, new effects or new ways of doing things? So yeah, another thing to do when I'm not feeling like my track is working that I'm creating is to experiment and be playful across genre. So, you know, I used to only make techno and it used to always be about 130 BPM. 
Uh, but now if I'm feeling, you know, sometimes have a different mood and my mood's a bit down or I'm just feeling like not banging techno out at 10 in the morning, <laughs> then I will like create some something ambient. So I've got a Matrix Brute that I love. And um, I'm usually just sitting there with that if I'm not feeling, you know, creating, or that's also great for techno, but I just like to play on it and do something ambient and record in. And all of this uh, music that I make that's not techno is, is really good as well for the publishing agencies because they will then try and sync this music and get it into film or TV. Um, so that's a really good thing to think about as well, is, is trying to find a publishing agent who, I mean, some of you might already have one, but someone who will help you get your music into different places and where you can actually earn money from your music as well, as opposed to just playing gigs. Um, collaborate, 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 collaborate. When I'm blocked, even this is usually for a longer period, so I haven't made anything myself in like a week or two or more um i'll see who what other producers are reachable right now does someone want to pair up because that's a good way to stay inspired um bouncing ideas off of each other and being able to yeah inspire each other and also i quite like it when a friend has a track that say 60 percent done and he says oh, i'll send it to you and then you can have a look at it and vice versa so also when you're blocked, sending it off to a friend, there's no harm in that. And either deciding to co properly collaborate on the track or maybe the friend just says, hey, did you think about doing this, this and this um, is quite a good idea. So another thing that I do is uh, journal and meditate as well. I know I've read this book, The Artist's Way. I'm not sure if anyone's familiar with it. Um, by Julia Cameron, and it's basically her saying exactly what I've been saying in this presentation, that we need to be in the right state of mind to make good art, um, and basically let all the stupid self-talk and thoughts that we usually have go in order to just really focus on being arty and creative. And she um, created a technique where instead of journaling normally about your daily life, you basically get up in the morning and within the first hour of waking up, you write three pages of whatever comes to your mind at that second. So I've read mine back sometimes and it's just like nonsense because, you know, I'd be like, oh, there's a pigeon outside my window and I'd actually write that down. But um, it's actually proven to get your mind in the zone to be very creative and to just kind of like channel all of your creativity. Um, so I recommend that for sure. Um, how I produce. So soon I'm going to go into, um, yeah, how I produce. going to do an hour on this and then half an hour with questions at the end. Um, and you know, be able to also dig out some old projects if anyone wants to see anything else. Um, I've got my hard drive with me. Um, so how I produce. Again, I'm just going to talk about it a bit first and I'll then, then I'll open Ableton. But I produce super quickly, staying in this flow that I've spoken about. Um, and if, if I'm not in that flow, I simply won't bother. I'll do one of the other things I've just spoken about as well you know like sampling or also just like listening to other music sometimes so this book really changed how I made music and how I approach things and it's basically saying it's the psychology of optimal experience so it's by this author that I really can't pronounce his name so I've just written it there for anyone that wants it <laughs> um but yeah, he basically says that, especially children that are in this like state of play, when they're playing, they don't think about anything else. They're just absorbed in that activity. And as adults, we've been programmed to kind of forget that. And, and we just like kind of get worried about everything that we're doing. And we forget sometimes to just have a lot of fun with it and not care about the outcome so much. Um, so 
yeah, I like to stay in this as much as I can. I'm not going to lie, it, it's difficult. And there's moments where I come out and moments where I come in. But I, I journal and I do keep track of that. So if there's like three weeks where I've not been feeling like I've been in this flow, I'll, I'll be able to see, okay, what else was going on in my life? Was I just really busy? Was I really stressed? Did I have gigs? Was, I, was it something personal? Or maybe this creative battery is just low and I need to just like give it a break. Um, so I definitely recommend reading that and understanding more from a psychological point of view how creativity works. So yeah, I have a daily routine. I am one of those annoying morning people. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I'm always actually ready to make music at pretty much the same time of day. But I know that basically everyone has their own patterns, their own habits and their own peak performance times. So really weirdly, I do think of it almost like an athlete, you know. Um, am I better at making music at night or is it in the morning? and really like shaping my day so that I can make the most of my creative time. Mine's from about like nine till lunchtime is my most creative time. And I still do make music after that, but I, I know that that's where I'm gonna make really good ideas. Um, so yeah, my studio is here. Luckily, I love Riverside, it's amazing. There's lots of really great producers around. I am very lucky that I can, yeah, knock on someone's door when I'm not yeah, when I, when I just want advice or like, wow, I try not to get advice anymore. I knock on someone's door when I'm making a coffee and I just want to chat, basically. <laughs> um, but yeah, now I'm usually, if I'm in this zone, I'm easily writing a track per day. Um, that's from start to finish. Um, but I would say that I'm not, I honestly don't think I'm the most technical producer in the world. I'm a very creative producer and I separate these two parts of my production. So when I'm doing the ideas and the creative flow, I'm not really mixing apart from taking away low end or high end of something. I do that all afterwards in an hour or so in the days or weeks after. Um, so when I'm initially making a track, I'm really focusing on getting the kick and bass right and then writing a melody or finding the hook for that track. And then all the drums and everything comes around and the arrangement after that. But when I start doing it, you'll see that I don't um, produce stereotypically in the way that I was taught even. Um, so yeah, the technical part personally takes me out of my creative flow sometimes. So if I'm like, oh, this has got too much low end, I shouldn't actually be using these two parts of this track together. If it sounds really good and I'm vibing with it, then I don't care until afterwards. <laughs> okay, if this is gonna like blow the speakers, then of course I'm, I need to tidy this up. But at that moment, I really, again, just try not to think about that. And I just go with how it's feeling. And I try, I try and want, I want as much energy and as much feeling in the track as possible. So I try not to, worry so much about um yeah all these rules that you've been told um i just try and do things my way if it sounds good and then afterwards come back to the technicalities as a completely separate pro process um unless just a bit on that you know imaging of sound is obviously very important i do do that a little bit during the creative flow as well because if i have say a pad that I want to be very wide. Um, that's part of the creative process for me because I need to hear that, okay, the pad is like on the outside and then I can put other elements, drums or whatever in the middle and it gives more space for that. Um, so I produce in the arrangement view only. I don't know, it's probably a mixture, but because I'm interested as well, who uses Ableton here? A lot of people. And who is mainly in the arrangement view? Okay, and the live, just to get a comparison. Okay, so it's about half and half, that's interesting. I feel like it used to be more in the live view, um, but now I think a lot of people have started looking into the arrangement view, I don't know why. I, I do prefer it, I just feel that I can 
see all of the things better. As if they're in these like tiny boxes, sometimes I'm like, I like to just, you know, stretch it out um, properly all on one screen. Um, so yeah, I progress a track as I go and it tells, for me, it tells a story better. So I'll start at the beginning with the kick and the bass and I'll actually move through the track and build up the elements. I don't start with the loop. Um, I, I feel like, you know, at music production school, I don't know, I went quite a long time ago, so maybe things have changed, but we're told, hey, you have to have a full loop before finishing, before going into the arrangement. That doesn't work for me because I'm already kind of like bored at that stage or it's just like, I then question, okay, when is it a full loop? When can I like arrange? Um, so I just do it as I go now and I find that a lot more fun. So yeah, I guess I produce backwards is the way I'd say it. Um, I have met a few people that do this as well, but I think a, a lot are using the loop method or at least getting all the elements there before arranging. Yeah, so my aim is to produce so I don't actually have to mix that much. Um, obviously for my own music, I'm making techno mainly. So this is super simple music. Um, it's linear and very like quite flat, apart from at times where there's like peak moments, but it's not like melodic house or, you know, some of my tracks only have like nine or 10 elements. Um, actually my track in 2018 that did quite well, the No, no Regrets, that's got the least elements I've ever made in the track. I think there's seven, I can show you that. And that was produced fully making hardware because I used to be very into hardware until I realized that it's just a bit of a pain <laughs> sometimes. Um, and yeah, I, I still don't have a MIDI clock. So I kind of, when I do use hardware, I'm, I'm using one machine each, um, and then recording it in. Although I do have the Model 24 Tascam mixer, which allows you to, yeah, play all of the machines I have at once, I find that, yeah, it's, it's, not, it's not synced. And getting it to sync is really difficult. And I'm not good at setting up hardware. So like once it's set up and it's all working individually, that's fine for me. So what I do is I often like use software and then I'll come to, okay, I need a snare pattern or clap pattern and my TR8S is handy for that. So I'll just use that for that. I won't like, I don't anymore like jam with hardware to make a track, but I used to. Um, and that's also a nice way to keep things simple because you've only got as much going as, I mean, unless you use the sequences a lot in the machines, I think, you know, it's easier to keep it simple with hardware because there's just less like possibilities, although there's still a lot of possibi possibilities. Um, so yeah, um, with the kick and the bass, this is a really important part of the track. And there are a million ways to make that techno bass line. I'm sure everyone has their own way. Uh, but what I've loved to use lately is the sub boom bass too. This is a really good VST. I'm sure that a lot of you have heard of it or got it. Um, I used to use toms a lot because they have a bit more character and then just kind of take the high end down away from them. But the method I'm going to show you today of, of, of like what I'm doing is going to be the sub boom bass because it's also just very quick. And as you know, I like quick things. So um, I will be honest as well. I'm not scared to use presets sometimes as a starting point and then change the preset. Um, obviously completely starting from scratch is always gonna take you a lot longer. So I say like I pick my battles, I pick the things that I'm doing completely from scratch. So I'm gonna show you as well these like FX, like synth one shots that I create myself. And a lot of things I obviously do create myself. But what I mean is if you've got full track sitting there and programming every single sound completely from scratch is gonna take you a really long time. And I don't think it's necessary. I think there's a lot of powerful VSTs that you can just 
you can tamper with and then also just save your own um sometimes when you're blocked you can go through and just make your own like presets and uh, and save those so so yeah i am going to show you two two main projects one is about the synths and the other one is going to be about how to build up a kick and bass so the synth one i will show you after i'm going to show you the i'm going to show you how i do a really quick kick bass pa pattern now so yeah obviously insert a midi track what I really love um, to make a kick is also the Kick 2 VST from Nicky Romero. Funny that it's like an EDM DJ that's created such a great plugin. Um, but yeah, I'm going to show you it. I'm not sure. Is anyone familiar with this? Just two people. Okay. Yeah, I would highly recommend this. I think it's like 50 euros or something. And I use it all the time now. Um, and yeah, you'll see why. <coughs> so yeah, if we just like have a simple four on the floor. <coughs> a lot of my stuff lately I'm putting as a G note. So I'll really try and um, keep most things in key. And this is also something I used to really care about a lot more than is necessary, I think, as well. Or oh, is it in the right key? Does it all sound tight with each other? I realize that sometimes being off key is also sounding good and sometimes better in techno anyway. I'm not sure about, obviously, melodic house. So don't do that. <laughs> But if you're making techno, sometimes it can just give it this kind of, you know, if you have a pad that's slightly detuned, sounds really cool um, and like a bit more sinister. So, yeah, I'm going to solo this. And you can see it's just a very plain kick pattern so far. I think um, I'm always starting at minus seven dB. Um, who else does that here? Do they already bring it lower when they're, yeah, few of you as well? Because otherwise, you know, trying to master a track that you've already produced at zero dB is going to like blow your speakers and the door. So minus seven is something I always start with. And then I have the kick here and it's just super easy because I can change by dragging this. We've also got the sustain and release here. I love very bassy kicks, but if I'm gonna create a bass line, I don't want that to mix too much with the kick. So I have to kind of pull myself out of making a really boomy kick because I'm gonna create a bass line now. So I want it to be I find that like having a punchy kick and good amount of top end is actually um, really good, especially if you have a lot of other elements on the track um, because it punches through. Otherwise, if, it's, if your kick's a bit dull, I feel like sometimes you don't hear it well, well enough. I personally like to have quite a punchy kick. So you can also do things like adding samples on top of here compressing um, actually within the kick program but yeah I'm always usually adding some distortion from the kick too and then yeah I think that sounds okay well I can from what I can hear from this monitor and then I'm always obviously starting with an EQ EP I just put in Um, I personally 
now use most of Ableton's built-in stuff. I used to use um, Waves and just everything else, but like, I, I don't know, I've had, I changed my laptop lately and it was such a pain to change everything. And I'm sure that's not the last time that that's gonna happen. And I also just feel like Ableton's really improved with its tools and the effects and everything are really good now. So I don't know why I would risk um, using just other plugins. Have you ever, like, I'm sure everyone here has opened an old like project and not been able to use it because it's just got a load of other plugins in there. Um, so I usually still would increase the, the high frequencies a little bit. And of course, like, the base ones a little bit as well. Um, and then what I'm adding on here is a redux, can just give it a bit more texture. Um, so yeah. Is this playing over the bigger speakers as well? Yeah, okay, cool. And then I would usually saturate the kick a tiny bit, just with the sine, the soft sine wave, and then pull the dry wet down. Get some resonance there. Yeah, there's many other things that you could just stack on here until it sounds good. I'm a massive fan of the vinyl distortion as well. But with these things, I feel like it's, it's good to really take just a little bit, like if you <laughs> load it all the way onto 100% wet, it's really gonna sound too much because you have to remember that this is just the kick and I used to think the kick was, it depends if you're having a bass line as well. Obviously, if it's just a kick, then you need to make it the best it can be. But if you're going to have a bass line, you need to just imagine that this is just one part to how it sounds. And I feel like the more character the kick has, the more it detracts from the bass line sometimes. Um, and I'm, at the moment, I'm all about my bass lines, but before I was all about my kicks. So it's like, it's a bit... So yeah, this sounds fine to me. And then I always want to try and record in right away because obviously you can do a lot more with audio. That's just me. And then I definitely usually play quite a bit with the kick, but I will, in terms of the pattern and some little tricks I do, but I'm gonna just create the bass line first. So this is sub boom bass. Yeah, as I said, highly recommend it. Um, this is number two. I had number one before, so I'm one of the diehard fans that has upgraded. Um, but yeah, I'm using this on most of my productions. It's also really great for drums and like toms, just like really, you can load the samples as well. And it's got really powerful two oscillators, filter, amp and distortion unit, which sounds really good. So I must admit that lately I've been taking like some baseline um, inspiration from faster music. So like I like the little Psytrance baseline or it's not just Psytrance, but you know, the three, three note 
thing, and I'm just kind of slightly changing that. So sometimes it's two notes, sometimes it's one, it's three notes. Um, let me show you. So again, I would want that to be G because the kick's G. A little bit fiddly because I usually have my big screen, but that's why I'm a bit slow. And then Okay, now I'm just going to go in and turn all the other channels off so they don't make noise. And here I'm just going to find something to start with. What I feel is that often I start with a preset, but then I change it a lot or I add a lot of effects so that it sounds completely different. So. When I'm listening through, I'm not imagining, oh, that's exactly how it's going to sound at the end. I'm just picking something that sounds good, but not incredible from the second I hear it, because hopefully what I do with it is going to make it sound really good. Um, it's probably a bit high. And I can already put an EQ and filter the top just to see what that sounds like. Or do a harsh cut. And then I've got a few tricks that I do with my bass to get it really bassy. And one way um, that a friend actually showed me ages ago is to use the corpus. Um, it's a built-in Ableton thing, which I'm sure some of you are familiar with. And I don't know if I can make this bigger. I can see it okay, yeah. Um, what I can do is layer a different sound over the top of any MIDI. Uh, sometimes it sounds good on synths to just layer, say, uh, marimba on top of a, a synth, but here I'm going to choose one, I'm basically going to tune it all the way down and then only use one or two percent of the dry wet, so let's try the membrane. So I've tuned it right down and then I just increase You can hear the rumble right when I... So I'd use about 2% um, usually. And then you can see it's already like maxing here, so I bring that down. Next thing to do is definitely to sidechain it. I always side chain the bass, obviously to make sure it doesn't interfere with the kick. And um, yeah, the new version of Ableton has this, but I always switch it back to this view because I find it a lot easier. And you can see that I usually push the out a little bit as well. After all of that, I, one of my favorite tools that I'm using on everything is the overdrive. Again, only using it on about 10% just to, because it's really powerful, that effect. I find that the overdrive can just overpower things. Um, so just using a little bit of that. And I must admit that I do saturate most things um, that I'm using because I always think it sounds a bit better. Again, only 
using it a few percent. Um, and then one more thing that I found recently that I really love to use is the drum bus in Ableton. Um, it's again really powerful, just like the overdrive, it pushes, like maximizes all the frequencies. Um, so I will show you what that sounds like. It's at 100%. already sounding I mean it's a bit difficult to hear with the speaker but I think it's already probably sounding quite That's um, making a very quick kick bass. Um, I, when I'm in my studio, I can hear properly about how that sounds. Um, but yeah, it usually is something I just do very quickly. And a lot of the time, I'm now just using two notes, which I'm also gonna see if that sounds better because I feel it sounds a bit muddy at the moment. Yeah, that's probably better. So yeah, that's my tips. Um, I really recommend using the corpus. And if I use anything externally that's not Ableton, I use, let's see if this works because my waves wasn't working lately. Uh, yeah, for some reason I click it and it just doesn't load. <laughs> I need to fix that. Um, but the API 560, it's a Waves plugin, and it's just like a multi-layer uh, EQ and multi-band. You can really push um, the frequencies separately, and um, it's really great. It's simple. It doesn't look good. I think it's very old, um, but I'm usually using it. And then another VST, another VST I'm using a lot from Waves is just the Kramer tape, tape-like effects, uh, vinyl effects as well. Waves have so many good VSTs, which unfortunately I can't open right now, but I'm sure that a lot of you are aware of them. Um, and sometimes if I feel like something's missing, a sound is missing something, I'll just like open the Waves um, bundle and see is there something in there that catches my eye that I think could make it sound better. It's like sometimes getting lost in there, but... <laughs> um, so yeah, that is part of the kick bass. So what I do, as I said, I always record the kick in and I'm always doing like little tricks with it, which I'm sure a lot of you do as well. Um, one of the main ones is, I'm just quickly chop this. One of the main ones, <laughs> I just got three, is uh, like just, you know, a two kick, and then one of them is a reverse one. This is something I do a lot, like obviously not too often because it disrupts the flow, but and then I'll color that a different color so that I know that's the part that changes. And maybe that's like once every 30 seconds, but apart from that, it's just a normal kick. Um, but then I like to do as well, like a little, if I do a double kick, then if you change the pitch of just one down or up, that can also sound really nice. So. So that also sounds good, so I'll color that another color, green. So 
so that, yeah, like maybe every so often that happens. And now I've got my kick pattern and that's, that's ready. Uh, and duplicate that to how long I think the track should be. Okay, that's looking fine. I always add markers. So that's my kick done. Um, I always put kick right at the top as well, probably like a lot of other people. And then the bass line. I think there's nothing more fulfilling than filling up that arrangement with one of the elements. Um, so yeah, that is, oh, that was the kick. Okay, this is the bass line. I keep the MIDI files and the MIDI tracks in there, but I really do try and record usually to audio because of the problems I mentioned before. So that's already the foundation of the track. What I'm going to switch to now is showing you how I built up melodies and synth lines in a track I actually did yesterday. And then we're going to try and recreate something like that today, just live. I'm also going to show you my drums as well. Mm. So the, this is a track that I kind of struggled with feeling that it w didn't have enough elements. Um, but then what I do every time I finish a track is upload it directly to SoundCloud on a private link. Um, and then I listen to it on my way home. I walk home, like very lucky again, I live nearby. And I always listen to it on my like Jabra in-ear earphones even if you have air, like AirPods or, I mean, I don't think AirPods are that great because the bass frequencies aren't like big enough. So as a producer, I would recommend getting something like the Bose or Jabra. And then I actually find that once you get used to the sound of your tracks on your earbuds, it's kind of good to play it like when you're producing and then listen to it on the same thing you always listen to it on. Um, so for example, with this track, I thought I should add more drums and I should add more elements. Actually, when I was walking home just yesterday, I thought, no, you know what, this is actually good. I'm, I think this is fine because I'm all, always trying to say like, you know, maybe it's not like complete, but it is in my opinion. So I'll just play you a bit of the track and then I'll go into how I made it. It's a very like, Quite a melodic track actually for my kind of techno. That's just a preview of the track um, and it's a very synth based track and um, what it is is about five of the same five or six of the same synth patterns layered together a couple of drums and a kick and bass and a few effects um, and I think if you have that kind of recipe for all your tracks I think each track should have one main focus, whether that's a vocal that you've like played around with and it's sounding really cool, whether it's sung or spoken word. If you have really cool drums or whether it's the synth. In this case, it's obviously the synth. 
and I made it like almost, yeah, all of it is with serum. I love serum. I actually only got it a few months ago after thinking it was more of an EDM VST or like one for, you know, more Psytrance. And I realized that it's just so powerful and I just love how easy it is to do different sounds with it. And yeah, and also the built-in effects with Serum are actually really nice as well. So um, I wrote the pattern with my push, which is why I've got it here today. And I'm gonna show you how I did that once we go back to the other project we just started. Um, but yeah, I love the push I've got. I'm not just saying that because it's powered by Ableton. Um, but there's like basically the repeat button here, which I use a lot. And then I'll change between 1, 4, 1, 8, 116, 132. And I'll just play around with that and then I'll hit other notes because if you have it on the repeat button, it's pretty much in sync with your music. And then um, I used to use, but I must admit I don't anymore because I'm able to get things sounding pretty good myself. But like if it's always there uh, is the scale tool. Um, so if you start to write a synth and um, some notes are sounding a bit off or, you know, you can obviously just put the scale tool on there. And if you're if you're like writing techno, I usually try and go for a scale that's like, you know, sounding sad. So the Dorian is a good one to use. And that's one that I would often just basically open a MIDI track. I'm going to show you open a MIDI track. Um, already put an EQ on there, take a bit of the low end off so it doesn't sound super muddy with the kick and bass because I'm always writing the synth after I've written the kick bass because so I can feel and I'm never just like writing a synth line on its own. I always have the kick bass running in the background to really feel how the mood is. And then, yeah, you can whack a scale tool on the MIDI channel and then um, that will also obviously all be, all the notes will be sounding good and harmonious. Um, I didn't with this one, I just played around and made it again very quickly and was quite happy with it because it's not often that I'm writing longer synth lines. It's not that this is even long, but um, yeah, there's basically two bars that are just like slightly different. Um, you've got the first one, which just sounds like this. And you've got the second one that sounds like this. And I was seeing as well, something interesting you can do is, okay, maybe you're not feeling that it's a super melodic track. I'm always just like recording a load of notes and then like looping it and seeing which ones sound good. Like I'm sure you could, that sounds really good as well. You know, and then this is the sort of track that after creating this, I'm happy with the synth line, I'm happy with the synth sounds, so actually maybe I just take one or two of these elements for my next track, change it slightly. Because when you're releasing an EP, it's actually really important that some of the, that the tracks all sound a little bit similar. So it's not a bad thing to reuse old elements. I used to also think, oh no, like I've already done this. I felt like I was cheating kind of, but um, you're not. And it actually is a good thing to have more of like a synced sound, especially when you're sending a demo to, to a big label because they want your package and like all your two to four tracks or however many it is to sound like it's part of the same EP. So I'd actually recommend doing that. So yeah, I've got this two parts of the melody here. Um, and then I've got a lot of different parts. This is the main lead. I've got an acid lead. This one, I've got two atmospheric, same melody, but just more ap atmospheric synths. Um, and then I've actually got a pad, which I've called atmosphere. <laughs> um, and then at the end, I have recorded in some uh, like different effects, synth effects, which I've then um, reversed and recorded with, with other effects on as well. And um, one thing I'm always using as a sample is noise. 
really can't be bothered to create that myself, to be honest. Like, there's no point. Um, 20 million producers out there have done it better than me, and it's a sample pack. So I just grabbed that. Um, again, for speed, because I know how I work. I'm not, a, I'm not a patient person. And if I'm worrying about how the noise sounds, I'm going to get bored, really. So I think it's also about like it, seeing your different production, what you enjoy and what you don't enjoy, using that maybe more as samples. Um, Something I've started doing lately, I used to just use like a ride um, with my drums or I used to use um, like 16th notes, but now I'm using these little three kind of tap like hits. It's sounding more organic. I feel like it sounds more like it's coming from a drummer. So I'll show you what I mean as well. Um, so I've got this. The track just starts with that and some synths and then the hat doesn't come in till quite a bit later. A lot of the time I'm putting all of my drums in a, a drum rack, uh, but sometimes for quickness I'm literally just searching my samples here like, okay, I want a hat, <coughs> looking through it. And then sometimes I literally I'm just putting it as the sample on the track. Um, depends. If I want to play around with it, then for sure it's better in a drum rack. But if, I'm, if I just need that hat and it's fine as it is, then why not just put it in on the arrangement? And it's just extra work to add it into a sampler or anything like that, unless it really needs the work. So I try to kind of minimize the elements like a hi-hat that aren't going to make a track, um, I don't like play around with them too much until I've actually finished the main idea of the track. Um, so yeah, this is, this is the whole track. I'm going to speak about the arrangement a little bit as well because I feel like lately I kind of improve with my arrangements a bit because if I had a synth-based track like this, I would get stuck before because the synth would just be going the entire time of the track and I thought, oh, it sounds boring. Or like by the time it gets to the break, no one wants to hear that synth line again. Um, and also from DJing, I've realized that if you have one element just repeating all the way through, in techno anyway, it does get a bit boring. And I try and build those moments on the dance floor because I, um, I, know, like I know what people like go crazy at now and I do my my sets personally are more energetic and they do have those kind of builds and those moments where you know they have a build and a drop so yeah I'm always putting markers throughout my track and um, here I've got um, an introduction as well well I've just like taken the low frequencies away from the kick but what I do is I actually um, always have um, an EQ8 on, on the master. And before I was using a pencil to draw in the moments where, okay, it won't stay like this forever, but just whilst I'm writing the track, this is the quickest way to just sculpt out where the breaks are gonna be. Um, and to really sound, hear what it's going to sound like with those bass frequencies, lower frequencies taken away. Um, so this track, I already started with, with the kind of only high frequencies. And it goes down slightly until, until there. Um, one thing I find is if, you, if the bass drops, it's always good if a new element comes in because that just kind of reinforces the impact. Um, and it's also just about playing around. What can you strip away that gives more impact after a break? What sounds good still in there? It's not necessarily the same for every track. Some tracks still sound good with the synth in, um, but for this track, because it's such a repetitive synth line, I have whole chunks where I've taken that out. And one thing I really like doing lately is doing that before the break. So people have a chance to, I do think of the dance floor when I'm, when I'm producing techno, obviously, because that's where I'm playing all of this. 
So I do think about, okay, they've already had three minutes or two minutes, maybe they just dance for a bit. And then when the break comes in, the synth comes back in and it becomes that really impactful, hyped moment where everyone stands or, you know, they shout or um, that's essentially what I'm trying to achieve when I make music as well. So I'll show you how I did this here. Um, So the synth comes straight in there at one minute. Then after 32 bars, it comes up again. And there's one element I haven't actually shown you yet, which is this like more sub bassy synthesizer, which I added to kind of carry the track when the melody is not there which I think works really well. I'll show you. It's just here. Oh no, that's not it. Yeah, a bit messy. But... So without that, I think it would sound a bit plain. I'll show you. This is with. Without that, it would be like this. You can tell the difference, right? So the first one is really like moving the momentum, but it's a completely different kind of synth. It's the lower frequencies, well, not completely low, but um, it's like carrying along still. And what I do here is I open the cutoff and I lower it and stuff so you can see I mean, I haven't done this in a detailed way. Again, this is more just like a sketch, this track. But then, you know, before I send this out or before it's properly signed, I'll go back through it and I'll do the automation with some more time. Um, That sounds much better already. There's a lot of movement. And I think that um, movement's a tricky thing, right? Because you want to add movement, but when you add too much, it sounds like all over the place. So with an element like that, it's okay. But with a main synth, I would need to do the automation really carefully and um, really take time with that, which wouldn't be in the same process as when I write it. Um, and then... Unfortunately, I don't have the MIDI for this, but I recorded it in. This sounds amazing to kind of carry the break. And also one thing I discovered lately is to increase, um, yeah. So, so basically filter higher um, towards the end of the break and it creates this kind of raising movement again, if you hear. On anything kind of very atmospheric, I am usually working with three things. Um, I love an auto pan, but just at the end, I'll show you that in a second. I love using an echo and a longer reverb tail. I think like a, a lot of people are using on their effects, but one thing that I, it's like a classic trick for me, which I've just always loved to do is, um, using the auto pan only right at the end. So with the white noise, that's, I love that because it's just like all through the middle, but then I auto pan pretty much the full amount, which I mean, wouldn't be possible with a lot of ways that people listen to music anyway, but then um, add the delay on the end or the echo as well. And then you get this kind of like movement of the white noise, which goes around, I'll show you that. And 
sometimes like have it going a lot faster or change the rate as well. Um, could change the rate now actually. So right now it's here, but it can be pulled up right at the end. Yeah. So I think that's good. Um, and I'm always working with yeah, lots of drum patterns. One thing I'm going to show you before we go back to the other project is how I'm building my snare rolls um, because I've used those in quite a few tracks, um, including my Pleasure Seeker track. And I love distorted snare rolls, but like arpeggiated ones that kind of the speed changes mm, because I do love snare rolls in general, although I'm a techno artist and sometimes it's not so cool unless you're a plastic band. Um, I, I think I, I've defined a way that I like to use them where I, I still think they sound okay. Um, and they also add a lot of energy. So I'm going to do that here and build a snare roll into this track. And then we're going to go back to our idea we started before. So just put a drum rack on. Searching my samples for a snare. I am guilty of this, but I usually put like the whole full amount of snares in sometimes because I just can't be bothered to sift through them <laughs> until they're actually in there. Um, and then just gonna start by finding a snare I like and then we can do the pattern afterwards. See what eight sounds like to start with. So I'm going to arpeggiate this to speed up at certain points in the pattern, but for now it's about choosing the right snare. That's quite cool. It's already a bit distorted. It's a 707, unless I'm not sure if you can see it there. Um, so I'll add an EQ. Still want to give it a little bit of body. Around there is usually good. Um, and then I play around with the length of it. And firstly, this. Oh, Always use the fade out here so that it's not so robotic. That's about it. Now I want to make it sound good. Of course, I put my overdrive and some saturation. A little bit of reverb as well, which I've got as a send in here. And then let's get the arpeggiator out. I've also realized lately that you can do this trick with the arpeggiator with synths or with anything, um, which I never really used for other things before. Um, So 
lot to see on this. Okay, I'm gonna see what this sounds like. Ableton really needs, that's the only thing I would like it to improve, is <laughs> like how fiddly this can be sometimes. Okay. I think um, with this less is more, so maybe less of it being arpeggiated would be better. That's better. Would always compress this to the kick as well. And one thing, if I had more time to go into it, is what I would try and do with the drum patterns and the synth is basically put the synth line right below the drum pattern and then um, basically look at the sequence and try and kind of figure out like where the roll should go. So like the roll maybe should go where there's a different note or a new note um, to kind of accentuate that sound. Um, so yeah, now I've got this part of the pattern. Let's put it in the break properly and see what it does. And if I just duplicate that, obviously it duplicates the, um, the arp changing as well. Okay. Okay, there's something happening is here here. Yeah, I think it sounds better just with the first one. What I would do as well is maybe towards where it breaks, add more arpeggiated rolls so it kind of builds the momentum. I would also try and make it a lot more noisy, um, put a lot of erosion on there. So I'm just going to tell you about this and not do it so we can get back to the other part of the track. And uh, yeah, I love snare rolls. I filter them in with the auto filter and I think that they can also become like a main feature of the track. Um, put as much distortion on there as possible and um, what's also quite interesting is using the same arpeggiator on a, on a synth line as well. So if you have both a snare roll and a synth line that could just be the whole track. Uh, so I think it's just about keeping things simple and finding different ways to to yeah to add different elements. Um, 
Did anyone want to ask any questions about this track in particular before I go back? I'm curious to see uh, the low end, like the kick and the bass on this track super quickly. Yeah, this one is actually just a sample because I, what I do often is work backwards. So for example, um, I made this yesterday, like literally. And what I will do now is go back in and look at the bass. But I really focus on the creative part of the track, which for me was the synth line. Um, and now I know it's a track that really works and I like it. Now I'll go in and redo the bass and the kick as well. Yeah. Um, so unfortunately, I haven't got an exciting answer for you there. This is it. But it's a very nice sample. I did chop up the bass. Um, and I layered the kick, there's two kicks layered on top and I've of course um, added some saturation and um, EQ'd it as well. Any other questions about this track? No? Okay. So yeah, coming back to this, I think the bass line I made earlier was actually nicer. Where is that? Here. Yeah. I'm going to use that one instead. Uh, dun, dun, dun. Okay, so I'm gonna show you how I do the creative part of creating a synth line. Um, and it's more about the pattern, so I'm gonna show you how I play around and how I find things that sound good. Um, we don't have that much time, so I'm not gonna go into a ton of detail, but I'm gonna focus more on the, yeah, creating the pattern. is quite slow for me these days. I'm usually on like 138 or something. I'm gonna open Serum. Um, I'm also gonna show you how I do like an effect sound with Serum. Um, I call them ear candy basically. So even if you have like a synth line running or something running. I think these kind of one shot synths are really nice that just sound really good. Um, so that when you're not, when you're listening to a full synth line, you also have these other interesting sounds going on. So maybe I'm just gonna make that first because I've just spoken about it. Mm. So it would just be, yeah, a one shot thing, not a pattern. I'm going to put it in G, maybe a bit higher than the kick and the bass. So I'm actually going to make it the whole size of that clip. And yeah, that's what it sounds like right now. I'm usually I mean, I'm using a lot of saw waves. This is also why I love Serum, because you can just draw, draw it in. And I also find that quite satisfying. <laughs> like, yeah, I drew my own one in. So there we go. And Serum's just like so powerful. If, if you don't use it, definitely suggest getting it. I actually didn't buy it fully. I rent mine from Splice because it's quite expen expensive. So just pay for it monthly. Um, and here I can basically change the pulse width. And you can do a lot of automation with that and there's just infinite things you can automate. Um, the VFX part here is, I mean, I can also just play this. That's 
so you can see what it sounds like. So the effects, I like the delay here and also the reverb. With the delay, um, I think it sounds good when you have the left as 1 8 and the right as 1 16th. Ah, feedback and mix. And then if I go back to the oscillators, I want a filter, uh, band, band pass 24, like a regular filter that we're used to. So what I just did there is I turned the resonance right up. And then, yeah, basically playing with both the pulse, the pulse width and the cutoff and the resonance um, and finding like a sweet spot for all of those and automating them. Um, so. Yeah, so you can do that in the arrangement. Um, and when you have like a little effect like that, it can really go a long way. So, you know, if, the, if you've just come out of a break and the main synth line stopped, put in a really big synth FX thing like that, and it can just sound amazing. EQ it properly so that, you know, you take away bass or whatever you, whatever you feel sounds right. And I would definitely get this one feeling very wide on the stereo image. So for that one, I use the Ozone 9, the imager. And um, it's already quite wide, you can see. But still, why not push it <laughs> until... So I'd stereoize this. And actually, it's working OK. It's not peaking anywhere. OK. And then if I turn that off, um, sounds like that. If you don't have the Ozone 9, you can also do the trick with the delay. Um, I'm sure like a lot of people have done this as well. So if I just take it off sync and put it on time-based, this one should be one millisecond. This 10, feedback to zero, dry, wet 100, and it does the same thing. Because, like, what I try to do is not be too reliant on plugins because, um, you know, computer might not be having a good time or, like, lost, broken, stolen, damaged, at a friend's house, whatever, having to use something else. So, like, I, I try and have the mentality that I could recreate everything from Ableton as well. So yeah, going on to kind of making a quick synth line and then I'll open up for like questions and a discussion. Um, I'm gonna do a longer synth line just like what we had before, but this part really is just like the fun part for me. Use 
serum again, but like I, I have just to talk about quickly what else I use. Um, I'm using the whole of the Roland Cloud DSTs, all of them. I think they're amazing. Um, I, I used to buy the hardware. Now I don't see the point because the software sounds amazing. Um, so unfortunately, my 303 is just sitting on my rack and I don't use it anymore. Um, I would definitely recommend getting that. I also have, um, I will just show you this quickly because again, I think it's really good and it doesn't get the recognition it needs. I use the Reason Rack plugin with Ableton. So everyone probably remembers Reason, right? The more like drum and bass -y, like, um, yeah, door back from 10, 15 years ago. Well, they've now got like a, a plugin which works with Ableton and they've got instruments, effects, like everything you can imagine, or, or even sample packs as well. And the instruments are really good. Mm. There's lots of synthesizers. But what I also like are these kind of like old school like samplers that they have in there. And I just find myself like using this a lot as well. One of the newer synths that they've added recently, which I really like, is this algorithm. It's an FM, FM sequencer, um, synthesizer. And I've used this in a lot of my recent tracks. It's kind of like, uh, if you, it's a bit similar to Massive. Um, so yeah, would recommend that highly. And then native instruments, I'm using Reactor 6 a lot. I think it's great. Also, the modules in there, that's as far, that's as close as I've got to getting into modular. Um, and it did inspire me at one point to, oh, maybe I should like buy a modular system, but then I was like, no, sticking to more software these days. Um, and then Trillion, um, the Omnisphere is amazing. And, but actually, like at the moment, I'm mainly just using Serum because I find I go through periods of using different VSTs and right now it's just, it's Serum. So that's where, like, that's what I'm used to at the moment. So yeah, just for speed, because we've only got 20 minutes left, I'm gonna, I, lo I got some more presets that I like um, from Splice, um, which are quite cool. So, okay, something else is being triggered here. I hate it when that happens. Um. What is that? Uh, I don't know, I just solo it. Um, so there's some really interesting sounds here. And some sounds are more kind of just using as, as FX, and some um, will work better as melodies. So. Let's just go with this one because it's sounding like it can write melody easier. So here on the push and also I'm sure with a lot of your controllers or even just straight in the door, why I like this is got the repeat button. So without the repeat, it's just like, you know, you can play any note with the repeat. start to see what would sound better. I think this is going to be... Even 
something like that, just switching the patterns and the rhythm. Sometimes you don't have to always switch the notes. And obviously in techno, it's about keeping it simple. Um, so it could even just be this. Let's just record that in so that it's in there. I've got a basic melody. But then maybe I decide that that's actually more like a texture and not even the synth. So that's what it's sounding like to me by just doing this as an experiment. So how it's all about how you EQ and use the sounds, obviously. So how about using the cutoff, keeping the cutoff quite low, and then it's something that actually sits with the kick bass as like a texture and rhythm on the top. So for that, I need it to be like quite heavily sidechained. like a pad but it's got a bit of rhythm in it still so yeah you might end up wanting a synth line and ending up with a pad texture thing obviously everyone so let's just duplicate that and see what we can come out with take these off It's like a. It's looking for like a normal sound. Yeah, not many. Okay, that's better. writing patterns is when it's perfect doesn't sound good and obviously I'm sure you know that that's why I like to use the push because um, the velocity is completely different and also if I'm a bit slow sometimes or a bit fast I actually leave it like that um, like for instance here I've left this gap on purpose um, and I've left this like this on purpose but like because it sounds better <laughs> It wouldn't sound good. It sounds 
sounds a bit better with the slight lag. And then this would also like... Also why I like Serum because you can play with the attack um, so easily as with a lot of other synths though as well. And then it's just I've already got like a melody I like, it's got a cool texture in the background and I think it's quite sinister, it's a bit trancey so now I would go ahead adding some drums and then arranging it. Um, so yeah, I think that we've only got 15 minutes left, so I'm going to open it up for some questions um, or comments, whatever you feel like. If anyone's got any, if not, I can continue. <laughs> yeah? Uh, uh, thanks for sharing. Can you hear me? Is it on? I don't know. OK. Um, do we mix uh, only with uh, Ableton or you use uh, something like uh, Pro Tools or? Like what, sorry? Pro Tools or something? I'll, no, just Ableton. Yeah, I started with Logic, um, but I find that I didn't find it as, as intuitive. So now I'm just using Ableton. Okay, thank you. Hi. Hey. Um, in the beginning, you said that you like to separate the creative process from the technical process. So how would that look like in Ableton, for example? So I, the state of the track before that I showed you, for me, the creativity is done on that now. Um, so now I would go in and start mixing. So probably I would leave it like a week or so because I would just see, like, does anything else need to be done? And then I would open the project and go through track by track, open my EQ, put it big on another screen so I can see it, and just start seeing if there's any frequencies that I need to kind of deduct or add to the mix. Um, and I would also make sure everything's got, like, as sounding as good as it can. And if I've used samples for things like the kick and the bass, um, if I've got time and I feel like I can add a bit more character to what I do, then I would replace them. Sometimes I do just leave the samples because, you know, it depends. Um, but if I have time, I go through and I make, I kind of just make improvements on everything, but I don't change anything massively. And for that, I'm also using Waves a lot, all of those plugins. But right now, they just decided to stop opening. So I need to update my computer or do something. Hi. Um, do you use reference tracks while mixing? Uh, no, not really. Um, I used to, and I did for mastering because I was trying to master some of my own tracks for a while, but now I got this, again, an incredible set of master plugins by this guy called Greg Calibri, and they just work amazingly for my tracks. Um, but mixing, no, I just, I basically, I'm going through to, to see if I've made any mistakes, um, to see if any uh, frequencies are overlapping and causing like a muddy sound. Um, what I do do is use uh, three different types of headphones and speakers whilst doing that. I use my studio speakers, I use my headphones, and I use even my Jabra earphones as well. So I listen to it on all three. And um, yeah, I try and 
I try and yeah listen to it then. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else? No. Yeah. Um. <laughs> I have a question. Do you ever go about swinging your drums, especially for this more like driving faster techno? Um. So before I had the push, yes, I would like swing them in the drum roll. Um, but now I have the push, like I feel it's a lot more organic anyway. So because adding swing just makes it a bit less rhythmic, right? So, um, and also I do record a lot of drums. The only thing I'm still using with hardware is my TR8S, and that's got a good swing, like little knob on it. But um, yeah, not since I got this, because when you're recording just organically, it sounds a bit more like swing as well, like you saw on the synth line. Anyone else? No? Should I just continue with this then? If, if anyone has a question, put your hand up. If not, I'll just uh, continue on this and add some drums and see where we get with the idea. I'm just questioning whether the bass line's needed in this track. Kind of sounds better just with the kick even. So yeah, now I'd start with I will try and add these little hat accents like I showed you before. Um, that's quite a nice one. And with drums, I never try to get too caught up on what the sample sounds like because um, I add a lot of effects. So it won't always sound like that. If it's just like one or two, then I don't record it and I'm just doing it in the drum roll. <laughs> Like a 909 is something I'm using a lot just for the hats because it just sounds really good. And I think also it's like when something's a bit familiar, people can connect with it. Um, so I think if you have one recognizable kind of sample or sound in your tracks, people like to recognize, oh, that's a 909 hat, <laughs> us producers. But. <laughs> And I could 
actually just like EQ these together and put them in a quick group. do is fill up the whole track and then delete as I go. So. some filler details, like I like to do reverse claps, um, white noise, more textures and pads. And then what I would do is duplicate that synth line um, and try and get some other sounds that like layer it, because I think it's very important to have um, a synth line that feels full. There's nothing worse than having a thin feeling synth. So that's something I'll often do when I come back and mix as well. In, is like, okay, maybe I need to replace that sound completely. Maybe I need to like, yeah, pay some more attention to it, add more effects, duplicate it. Um, sometimes the old trick of like doing one octave lower and one higher and having those very quiet, um, adding a ton of reverb on the very high one, but putting the volume right down. Um, but yeah, I think usually if I have a synth line, there's like three or four versions of that. Because I think as the track goes along, then um, it's good to kind of switch them out so it sounds fresh and keeps it engaging. But during the break, probably like add them all together so that you can really, uh, yeah, it really sounds like full. But yeah, I think that's, um, that's it from me. If we had more time, I could go into more detail. But um, I focus mainly on the creative stuff. If you have any more questions, we have a few more minutes. Um, but if not, thank you all for coming. It's really nice to see such a good turnout, and I hope that you enjoyed it. If you have any comments or questions later, feel free to write to me on Instagram or, or any of the channels, and I'll try and get back to you. So yeah, enjoy the rest of your dance music event here, and maybe see you around.